Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the different countries that we're all gathering from. For me, I'm hosting this event tonight from Brunswick East in Nam, also known as Melbourne, land of the Kulin Nations. I'd also like to pay my respects to their elders, from those who pass to those who are currently present and maybe here with us and those emerging. Feel free to please share the country you're joining us today through our chat section. Now, as a short introduction, my name is Emil. My pronouns are he, she, and they. I'm a peer navigator. So basically I support people that are newly diagnosed or just coming to terms with their HIV diagnosis at Living Positive Victoria. I'm also the Gen X coordinator, which is a group for people living with HIV under 30. I'll also be tonight's host and moderator. Um, now, as some of you may already know, migrating and settling into another country can be a stressful and lengthy process. It is filled with uncertainty, uncertainty a substantial amount of money. And I know for a lot of the people I've met, an HIV diagnosis may feel like a roadblock from a future that you've, dreamed, you've been dreaming of. I hope with tonight's event and from hearing Tico's story, that it instills you hope, insight, and an outlook that an HIV diagnosis is not on the way, but just along the way in your plans migrating, maybe permanent, permanently to a country like Australia. I do have to stress that people, um, that please don't take tonight's event as migration or legal advice, nor do any of the statements we make tonight as such. Um, and now I wanna introduce you to tonight's guests. Satrio Nindio, Nindio Istiko, also known as Tiko. They're an HIV positive Indonesian who came to Australia in 2016 as an international student. In 2017, they became a refugee. And after four years, today, this year, actually, congratulations, Tiko, they obtained their Australian citizenship. At the moment, they are doing their doctoral research at the School of Public Health, University of Queensland, looking at the role of how migrant networks um, help each other for sexual health literacy, particularly among newly arrived Asian born gay, bisexual and men who have sex with men in Queensland. Prior to this, they also worked in the HIV sector for the past five years and recently finished off at Queensland Positive People as the peer navigation team leader. Please give Tika a warm welcome. Hi Tika. Thanks Emil. That was a wonderful introduction, wonderful of beginning. <laughs> of course, welcome. Thank you again. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And thank you all of the attendees for joining us too. Um, so I guess first and foremost, Tiko, like, um, please introduce yourself. Tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, I'm just trying to think about what else can I say um, uh, besides mm. the introductions. Well, I suppose it's really important for me to share a bit that um, I have a very huge passion about the migrant communities, um, you know, all throughout whatever, I don't, regardless of the visa that you have, I've always find that it is fascinating and there is so much work to do uh, in the field of migration. And because um, of my background, um, uh, I went to medical school in Indonesia, and then I came here uh, to Australia to do a master degree in health management. And then now I'm doing my PhD in public health. That intersection between migration and health is pretty much um, something that I really hold dear to my heart. Um, and I think there's still a lot of um, work to do. Absolutely, absolutely. And, um, and I guess in this work, I also would like to mention that I've spent so much time on this land that is owned by Tribal and Jagra people. And that my work in a lot of ways have been getting a lot of support from our original and Torres Strait Islander communities. I've come across people from the communities that have been quite generous in trying to support me and understanding how Australian system in general, not just the migration and the health system, 
um, can be difficult to navigate and complex. And I've learned so much um, through the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their leadership. So I just want to kind of acknowledge that. Um, yeah, and as you said, this year I have my citizenship, which was actually quite an interesting event because for quite a while, I think they sort of held, um, that they, they postponed the citizenship ceremony in Brisbane, I think, in Brisbane City Council because of the COVID-19 lockdown. And then I think the ceremony that I attended was the first one after the series, after the first lockdown that we had. And it was huge. There were, I think about 900 people attended. Um, and it was such a moment for me um, to be there uh, because of a lot of reasons. And I remember that a few days after I attended that citizenship, that this place is basically kind of like my second home. And I kind of feel that, you know, I'm not culturally, I'm not just an Indonesian, nor am I culturally just an Australian. And it's a mixture of both. And I'm really proud of that. Um, and I hope that if that sort of resonates with anyone who's attending tonight's event, then yeah, that's great. It's great to be here. It's great to know that you are all here. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think for a lot of us who have moved here or moving here or staying here right now, there's always this kind of like, are you X enough or are you X enough? And we don't really focus so much more on just being in that middle. And that's actually okay. Because there's a lot of people in the middle. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, well, I guess like going back, because this is like the now, the present. Can you tell us a bit about your migration journey? Um, um yeah, absolutely. So when I was in my medical school, I was already looking for, I was thinking about what else could I do besides being clinicians. And that's because working as a clinician at the front line, one of my biggest frustration was to see that a lot of the things that affect our health are basically coming from a system level. It's systemic, it's about policy, it's about environment that we live in. And as a clinician, I feel like, you know, I'm just keep on treating people for the same diseases and I didn't feel like I was contributing much um, in terms of making a difference at the population level. There was a sense of frustrations for that. At the same time, I remember that um, I was already identifying as a gay man and quite comfortable with that. And I was quite open in Indonesia about my sexuality as well. And I remember being in your 20s and as a gay man in Indonesia, that was not easy because a lot of my friends and my family members were quite, um, well, yes, homophobic, yes, sure. Uh, that's uh, quite a catchphrase, I suppose. But more than that, it's just basically about giving this sort of pressure to me to sort of conform to the societal pressure. And so I was just looking for an option to where else can I go? Where else can I learn? Um, a place that I can feel safe while at the same time continue to exploring my career opportunities. So it's that balance between safety and career. And then, so I was just going through some of my options and I decided, okay, I'm gonna apply for a master degree here in Australia. I, I applied for um, a scholarship and I got it. And I, so I came to Australia through that uh, scholarship, um, which was exciting. But I remember when I left the country uh, in Indonesia, there were a lot of, um, news, um, uh, just basically news about LGBTIQ persecution. And that was in 2016, early 2016. And the root cause is basically a bunch of politicians who got on the social media. Uh, suddenly they now can find information about what the young people were up to. And some young people at the University of Indonesia basically developed this sort of a study group, study slash research group focusing on sexuality and gender. And LGBTIQ is part, was part of that focus of the group. 
And then they were suddenly thinking that um, this is sort of like a Western agenda and we should reject this and all that sort of thing. And that caused a lot of problem because a lot of the provinces in Indonesia then started to uh, basically implement, develop and implement um, a quite um, punitive laws against LGBTIQ people. And quite, they're quite arbitrary too, um, in terms of how they define people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and queer. Um, and so I was just thinking about that. And then um, I remember in 2016, I was going through my options of, okay, what else can I do now that these happen in my home country? And I um, came across a friend of mine who suggested I should meet with a migration agent and I got a migration advice um, through that migration agent. And basically from there, uh, after several months of thinking and weighing my risks um, and, and, and I suppose um, not benefit, but like, you know, just sort of understanding what are the risks of each of the options that I had at that time. And I decided that I needed to apply for refugee visa and I did. And then in 2017, I got that refugee visa. So, I, and, and, and 2017, when I got refugee visa, at the same time, I just finished my uh, master degree. And so then that allowed me to live in Australia as a refugee for a couple of years until this year I became a citizen. Right. Because what were those options for you that you were thinking about? Like you were saying, like there's risks and all of this, like what mm. were those options that were? So um, I think this is probably, that's a very good question because it's about understanding that sometimes migration changes a lot. And mm. there is this thing where a lot of migration agents will say every July you gotta you gotta check on what you know changes gonna happen, um, gonna be implemented for that year. And the reason for that is because generally the migration program in Australia um, are developed based on economic purposes. For a, if you if you look at the migration history in Australia, initially uh, post Second World War. Um, it's all about nation building and then also for improving the economy of the country by basically trying to get some short term labor that we can sort of deploy in some sort of essential industries. But then globalization in 1970s sort of changed the landscape. You know, we hadn't uh, hadn't had war for a very long time. Um, so, well, at the very least, not the war that Australia were heavily involved in at that time. So globalization sort of changed the landscape of migration and introducing this sort of um, uh, globalized financial market. And, and from there, increasingly, um, particularly throughout the 1990s and uh, until now, uh, there is a fight for global talents. And so a lot of the options for migration, if we look at it, is basically about those um, uh, talents and, and, and uh, labor market and employment. So a lot of my options that I was going through were basically a variety of that. You know, uh, they look at my English skill, uh, my qualification, whether I got it from uh, in Australia or not. And they look at uh, my professional experiences and all that sort of thing. So those become a very important um, criteria to think about and then come up with some option of visa that I might be able to apply. But even by then, it was very severely limited for me because I moved here at the time I didn't have much um, working experience because I literally just finished my medical school. Um, and so I had no particular experience um, working with that. Um, and also my career, I was already looking at, you know, beyond being a clinician as well. So yeah, so mostly the options that existed at the time was about um, uh, employment-based visa. Right. So I suppose is this where you essentially applied for a job to work for QPP? for Queensland positive people, is that at that point? Yeah, so that sort of happened. It's quite a funny story. I was I was just looking for a job in general. Yeah. And at that time, I didn't even, I wasn't uh, planning to apply for a refugee visa when I got the job at QPP. Yeah. So I opened my mind, I broadened the scope of jobs that I was looking for. And then I was already getting in touch with um, QPP because about three months after I arrived in Australia, I got diagnosed with HIV here. Yeah. Um, and then three months after I got my diagnosis, came 
a, a job oppor a job opportunity employment ad from QPP and I applied for that job. Right. And I already knew um, a person who worked uh, at QPP at the time, and that person rang me and said, oh, so um, it's good to see you the other day, and it's great to see that you're sending your resume and your job application for this job, but the thing is, we apparently already got someone for that position, um, right. but we're thinking of you for another project, and the, and the project that they were thinking about was about supporting migrants without Medicare, and living with HIV in Australia and navigating the HIV system here. So I said, yeah, absolutely. So I get on, um, on, on that project and yeah, the rest is just history. Yeah, amazing. I mean, like with what have you learned? I guess like, you know, being in this project where you are supporting a lot of people without mm -hmm. Medicare migrating to this country. Mm -hmm. um, what did you learn being in that role? Um, that's a good question. I suppose the first thing that I've learned is that how so much of, uh, of, of the migration process is literally beyond our control because even the availability of the type of visa, how each visa has criteria and all that sort of things is, is, is non-negotiable. We just have to look at what's available in front of us and then just try to apply, you know, um, and, and we might get and we might not get it, you know. Um, and then so much about the migration process is about economy, as I was saying, and that means yeah. that they're really assessing our um, potential to contribute to the, to the community, uh, to the Australian economy, sorry. So that's about whether we have a job or not, whether we're paying tax or not, what assets that we have. So much is about those kind of assessment. Um, and regardless of what UFISA is, is it, they're still... Um, um, have this notion that these aspects are quite important for migrants or the most important for migrants. And that's really problematic because, you know, it's reducing our migrant experience into our economic identity or potential economic contribution and not really looking at the other types of contributions that occur as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's basically about really valuing uh, in the same way that we value economic contribution about you know, the social cohesion and and what do you, because I was already working for QPP supporting uh, not only migrants, even though that's the project that I started with, but then I, you know, supported other um, Australians living with HIV as well. And, you know, what about that? You know, and, and it's, it, and, and it becomes a lot more transactional too, which I kind of um, really finding it problematic, you know, right. um, uh, but yeah, it, it is the way it is. And so that's the kind of a few hard lesson that I, that I learned immediately. And then I think, you know, on a more positive side, migration has taught me a lot about where I fit in the world. It, and this is more internal reflections about who am I and what kind of person that I want to be what do I want to do with my life um, and things like that. So if, if anyone um, attending this event tonight ever feel like migration triggers a lot of existential questions, I feel you. It, it, it really is, you know, and there's no easy way to, to navigate these except to connect with others who are already going through the same process. Well, I guess like to to follow through with what you just said there, where and who did you get your support from? Um, because I was already, um, uh, I was working at QPP, so I, I was blessed um, that I got that um, support uh, through QPP. And that gives me, I think that just gives me a sense of like, you know, I am not just um, in a limbo. Sure, there's a lot of uncertainties in my life, but every day I'm feeling this uncertainty with a sense of purpose. And that was really helpful. And through this shared purpose, we all just want to support people living with HIV. I made connection. I've continued to make, you know, wonderful, amazing connections, professional, personal, social, all of those. Um, and I think I really would like to highlight here that 
the process in which we go through the migration on a individual level, or I guess mm. interpersonal level as well, is that it has a lot to do with thinking about how you would like to build your life in this limbo period. So much about the way we think about our future must be, you know, it's hard. We have to put on hold so many plans that we have in our life, you know, and I understand that it's, it's that's not easy, but it also allows us to think about who do we want to uh, surround ourselves with and what do we want to do with our everyday life so that we can have uh, a sense of purpose at the very least, you know, um, and I think that's great. I think that's great in that sense. I'm not saying that it's great to the point that it sort of um, substitute the pain that we have going through the migration process. Definitely not. But it gives me, I think, a certain uh, a determination that no matter what happens in the end, no matter what the outcome is, um, I have filled my everyday life with a purpose. And I've, shared, and I've lived my life with the people that I really want to be with, you know, the people that I admire, the people that I really care about. Yeah, so it sounds like, you know, even though you had your plans about living here, like potentially, hopefully, you still had other strategies put in place to basically make yourself feel like you're not putting everything in one basket. Because it'd be difficult if you suddenly commit to all of these things, just focusing on getting the citizen, or, you know, visa. Yeah. And that's the thing about, um, the English term is precarity, about living in a precarious um, conditions. And many of us live in a precarious conditions, you see, um, as migrants. And then, you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of other people also live in a very precarious conditions. And the thing about precarity is that and what makes it so freaking difficult and so dehumanizing from precar precarity is that often we... we have to do so much but for so little gain mm. it, it, that's the difficult part and and it's so important for us though to think as well that this diversification strategy so you diversify your skill diversify the people uh, that, that that you know the people in your life this diversification sort of strategies can also quite helpful in, in, in other parts. Sometimes we get job through the network uh, that we have. Sometimes, you know, for those who want um, partnership, you to be in a romantic partnership or whatever, they do find that as well through, through this kind of um, way. You know, you open up your life, you, you do things that you may not necessarily do if you're not in a migration process, but you put yourself out there um, and then, you know, kind of magic happens, if that makes sense. Um, and I think, uh, I, and I get it. Yeah, sometimes the gain that we get through the, the really hard work that we have to do every day as migrants, um, sometimes it's just not worth it, but other times magic happens. And then, um, I don't know, I, you know, I get to know you for an example, Emil, and how long mm. have you known each other? It's amazing, you know, I wouldn't be able to, um, get to know people like you, for an example, and I still feel very grateful of that. Yeah, because I guess like um, I'm kind of going through your migration journey, even when you were trying to get support, say, for example, for advice, because I know some people would be like, I, I need to get a lawyer, not a migration agent. Is there so much of a difference between the two or? Uh, they're all intersecting. So I suppose migration requires you to develop a lot of skills in terms of organization skill. How do you manage your time? How do you manage your um, money? Uh, that takes a lot of resources. How do you manage your relationships? You know, it takes a lot of those kind of management skill and, and it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a hard one, um, but it, it shows resilience um, though resilience can be a problematic word as well. I acknowledge that, you know, but um, it does. It, it, you, you develop skills that you never know of. You develop certain muscles, um, but I don't mean muscles in a literal sense, but you develop certain uh, muscle brains or social muscles that you never know you had before um, as a migrant. And you, and you learn that through this resilience, through this grit and determination. Right, right. 
That's great. And I guess, you know, it's like one of those things that you, you really learn how to swim when you're surrounded by water constantly, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is exactly that. So in terms of, I guess, like finding the migration agent, was that referred to you or did you just find them? Like, yeah. So it's really good. Really recommend that um, if you live with HIV, which everyone in this in this event is, um, to ask for your um, peer-based organizations about uh, which migration agent to connect with, in particular in Australia, because of the system. Um, it's it's worth to try to find migration agents that um, you feel comfortable with, that you can trust, yes, but also have some experience in the health waiver department at the very least. So health, health waiver, um, for those who are not familiar, is obviously about um, certain types of permanent residency visa. Um, they have these options where they can waive uh, the fact that we're gonna cost Australian health system a certain amount of money if we can provide a certain evidence on our uh, economic contribution. So that's coming back again about, you know, the asset though, the our tax and what kind of work that we have and all that sort of things, um, awful things. And then a few other um, evidence about, about um, our, uh, the fact that we have socially integrated to Australia um, and all that sort of thing. Um, and so to get a migration agent who are familiar or experienced with this health waiver process is really important. If you then can get someone who also has have supported people living with HIV before, that's even better. That's icing on the cake, you see. But for me, I think the the, the first one is about health waiver first, because if you can, if you already have your peer organizations, then your peer organization and your migration agent can sort of try to work together to maybe find some, uh, develop some argument and evidence uh, to support your visa application process. Um, but yeah, that's I think is what important for me when when I was going through my um, protection visa application process to become a refugee, I approach um, HIV AIDS Legal Center in Sydney, um, and then I approach. Um, Rails, so Refugee and Asylum Seeker Legal Service based in Brisbane. Uh, and then um, I decided to go with the one in Brisbane because I live here. I just right. feel much more comfortable to be able to go to their office if, if there is any issue or if I have if I need a meeting or something like that instead of doing it just by via phone or Zoom. Um, this is pre-pandemic, of course. Um, of course. So that's what I decided. And um, with... I guess like uh, now you got your your um, citizenship. Yeah. You've gone through this journey of waiting for yeah. four years through it. Mm -hmm. um, what has been the most challenging part of it for you? Um, I think for me personally, the most challenging is that my relationship with my family back home is complicated because of the, the visa that I have to go through. Um, when you apply for a refugee visa, you cannot uh, visit your family when you are on that particular refugee visa until you become a citizen. And, and so you cannot do short visit. Um, only for certain um, emergency um, that they will allow you to go uh, to your home country. So that's difficult in managing those relationships. Coming back to what I was saying in the beginning, because, um, you know, um, my parents are quite homophobic. Um, um, so they don't understand that there is a country or there are, there are a lot of countries wanting to protect people like us. Like they don't just, what? <laughs> they find it really weird. <laughs> so they don't understand that. <laughs> and yeah. then when I said, I can't go back home because I'm not allowed by the country. And they're like, who dare to say that? Who, who come up with that rules? And I was like, uh, the international <laughs> <laughs> agreement, like a lot of yeah. countries out there. So they just don't get it. So that's hard for me to, to, to manage that with my family. Um, and I was all, always scared about what if something happens to them and then I cannot be there for them. That's hard, you know, because um, I think, because I'm not, I'm, not I'm not a person who 
really seek my parents' acceptance of my sexuality or something like that. I've learned yeah. uh, in my mid twenties to kind of let that go. You know, if they just want to be that, then that's their issue. Um, mm-hmm. I I do still think like the I I like trying to take care of them along with my brother. Um, so that's the, uh, the 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 thing that I'm concerned about is that if something were to happen um, to my family and then I couldn't uh, be there for them. Um, so yeah, that's the hardest part. And then the hardest part was when I work at QPP and I and I supported other migrants living with HIV to try to navigate um, the HIV system. That's really difficult because I know that as much as I'm also a person who share a lot of similar experience with you all, um, that pain in going through migration process is still a very internalized individual pain in that sense. Like it's hard to 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 feel like you can connect with other people. You often feel like you're you're isolated and no one gets what you're going through. No one understands that. Um, so that's rough to see another person going through that very difficult period. Yeah, I'm so sorry to hear that. It's just like, it's hard because you're balancing your own safety, but also like this necessity for you to connect with your own family. It's mm. really incredibly hard to wrestle. And I guess it just sort, sort of highlights the everyone's migration journey is so unique to themselves. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And I respect um, that. So I guess like if you were to be able to give yourself advice you know, your past self and advice, what would it be? I don't know. I don't know if it's much of an advice or I think, Mm. well, maybe there is an advice as in like, love yourself. You see, there's so much about living in a precarious conditions and living in a very, in a system that oppresses you, that makes you think that you're not worth loving or like Mm. that, uh, that, that it's your fall that it's your deficit uh, that causes all of these issues but it's not it's really is not and I think I'm very lucky to be able to learn to trust the people that care about me and I and I really care about them so much because that's allow me to to survive um, as well and thrive not not only just survive but thrive as well so I think yeah it's about it's about that yeah it's so beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, and if there's any kind of message of hope that you would like to pass on or share it to our attendees or for anyone who's a person living with HIV who is in the process or wants to migrate to Australia. Um, Information is power. Um, network is power. And you would love you you would need all of those things to feel empowered during your journey in migrating to Australia. Okay. It's really, again, migration as difficult as it is, it has, it is a moment where you can actually question um, who do you want to be and what are the kind of people that you want to surround yourself with. And by asking all those questions, you're actually starting a journey of self-empowerment because not everyone gets to ask those questions, you see. They, they, they come across the questions very late in life. Uh, but migration introduces us all to all of those existential questions. So sit with that pain and that um, discomfort and really try to use the information, gain more information if you need it, diversify your network, get to know the people that you usually probably wouldn't even approach to um, do all of those sort of things. Absolutely. Yeah, because I recall even I've known people who just were so determined to stay here. Mm. And, you know, because I I remember for some of the requirements, you have to volunteer, for example, for Mm. somewhere. And as we were mentioning before, while we were chatting that so many people tend to do that after finding out about it, not beforehand. It's just like, <laughs> try to, I guess. Absolutely. And I, and I get that though, because, you know, we live in our world and then suddenly, oh, so I can't migrate to Australia. And then you're being presented with all of these sort of options to be able to improve your possibility in migrating to Australia. And suddenly like, I'm, I'm none of these things. 
but okay, I'll go through it. So it can cause like what is comfort. And I, and I get that. Um, but again, it's about this, it's about taking a risk to then reconfigure who you are and what you would like to, to, to do in this world. It's about those kind of opportunities that is very rare in life. Yeah, I think that's really great. I think that's such a positive way of looking at the migration journey, despite all of these challenges that do happen to you. Because yeah, it's extremely existential. Mm. Not only are you thinking about your future, but who you are, your identity, and the people that you're surrounded by. And I guess here, like, you know, if you have the privilege or the capacity to reach out, because even for me, what I've learned about it is that when you ask for help, it will come. Mm. I think the hard, yeah. Absolutely agree. Hey, um, yeah. I think that's an important point. Um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, totally. I think it's just that because I think so much of us, and I suppose maybe I don't want to get too philosophical around it. It's like maybe it's a neoliberal kind of way of thinking, but it's there's so much power of just actually saying, okay, this is actually what I need. And this is like where organizations like Business mm-hmm. Positive People, they've been Positive mm-hmm. Victoria, Positive Life New South Wales. NAPWA, like HIV organizations, you can just tap onto them because that's what they're there for. You tap onto them and you tell, you ask, you tell them, I'm like, okay, this is what I need. And the least we could do as organizations is to lead you the right way and connect you with the right people. Because and, as, uh, yeah, yeah, go on. Go on. Finish. Go on. Oh, uh, no, I was just kind of adding in about like that reaching out is actually creating a collective care rather than individual care. And I think collective care it's so important coming back to, again, my point about diversifying the network of people in your life, because that's one of the, you know, it's it's much better to be able to sit here, even though like this is like online, and I'm mm. saying that, you know what, my migrant journey has a lot of shit story. <laughs> but, hey, who are these people that I get to see and I get to meet and what a wonderful opportunity. And it's genuinely, I feel wonderful, genuinely, um, um, that's just, I feel blessed in that, in, uh, 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 in that part of life. Um, and it, this move towards focusing more on collective case, I think, I think is really important. And who knows, after you feel like you're finished with your migration journey, you want to pass it on. You want to be much more involved in the ad- I hope you didn't freeze. We'll just hold on while Tico connects again. Okay, um, you connected on. You froze for a oh. second. Oh, sorry. No, I was That's just it. saying that I think the move to collective care, um, you know, once someone finishes their migration journey, um, you might find yourself, um, you know, you're wanting to advocate um, uh, and then, or you wanting to uh, get more involved with social issues because you have found yourself in a, in a, in a situations where, you know, you, you, kind of understand that there are um, uh, issues in our society that is caused by the system. So you want to be able to be part of that advocacy. It's great. That's great. That's great. Honestly, like it's really great advice. And also, uh, sorry, I was the one gaslighting you. I was actually the one that froze, according to everyone. How dare you gaslight me, <laughs> girl? Now, some questions from um, attendees. Please, if anyone here has any questions for Tico, please shoot them through the chat. Um, the first one is from Simeon. Uh, Tico, with all those uncertainties of the permanent residency application process, or, um, you know, how do you take care of yourself and make sure you continue to, to be positive and never lose hope? Okay, I'm going to be vulnerable here because that's such a great um, question, Simeon. And also, hi, Simeon, long time no see. Um, first of all, there is no one single self-care that is correct. So we need to get out of the mindset that there is only one single self-care that is correct. It's not all about mindfulness, but if mindfulness works for you, go do it. But it might change and it might be about doing, again, more collective care rather than self-care. Um, it's about maybe doing wild self-care where you engage, engage with you know, a certain risk um, sexually or otherwise. Whatever okay. way that you, you take care of yourself, there is no right or wrong way. And I think it's important for us to just care rather than thinking about whether your care strategy is mor- morally correct or not and things like that. You're in a position where it's difficult. We, we are all in the situations where it's already difficult. We're living in a precarious conditions 
I think we need much more strength based and, and, and acknowledge our vulnerability and our strength um, and, and less judgment about whatever care, uh, care strategies that you have. That's great. Um, the next question is from Wynn, although when I think you're asking for a, a migration advice here, which we're not able to give you, unfortunately, but I'll pass it on to Tiko anyway. Wynn is, uh, uh, is also Indonesian. They're holding a graduate visa at the moment that allows them to stay in Sydney for two years. But their mm. future plan is to become a permanent resident here. Mm. Um, if, if they went to regional area, for example, and got the job there as an accountant, is it mm. possible for them to get a permanent residency you know, mm -hmm. and living with HIV? Have you met people who've gone through this journey? Uh, first of all, Wien, thank you for the question and for sharing as well. Um, I just want to acknowledge that the temporary migration program in Australia has changed um, in the history of Australian immigration. And one of the particular changes that we have seen in, uh, in particular after the Second World War is that it's much more common, it's becoming much more and more common for people to stay in temporary migration program for a very lengthy period of time. There is a couple of studies focusing on seasonal uh, farm workers who work in regional areas and, and also other types of temporary migrants. And they found that um, a lot of us um, a lot of the temporary migrants have lived in Australia for about seven to 10 years being on temporary migration. So what I want to say is it's that there is no easy way of whether, oh, if you do this, can you get a permanent residency? What I can say, though, is that because they're assessing based on um, your potential economic contributions, making sure that as you live here, you save money so you do have uh, you're always saving money in the banks and that that accumulates one is that to um, uh, act, make sure that you have some sort of career plan um, or something like that you you don't know what opportunity is presenting right in front of you or the opportunity that you already have now and it's worth to 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 develop some plan and see if that can be work out into a career where you get some sort of visa Second, a third thing is that always polish your English skills, having a very recent IELTS test, because IELTS, IELTS test is basically valid every two years, and really putting your time to improve that, it can also be very beneficial. Um, it, and I know, and this is very rare, that some people do then get Australian-based qualifications, and that also helps to, to, to put on some uh, you know, arguments. So all of these strategies in general um, uh, it's not leading to a particular permanent residency visa, but no matter what the permanent residency visa that you're going to have, even if you're going to end up with a partner visa, you'll see that all of these things can, can help to build your um, uh, argument in your visa application. I hope yeah, that's that makes sense. Sense. Yeah, that's, that's really great advice. And I guess like you said here, I've always thought of myself the temporary visa is just like caught into two years. But as you mentioned, a lot of people actually just keep on extending this and at the same time, building themselves up, building up the social capital, building up their networks, some of them finding partners. So it's just kind of like, yeah, that's really, Absolutely. really fascinating. Social capital, cultural capital, and I mean that, but cultural capital is education and financial or economic capital. Yeah, right, amazing. Um, uh, one of the attendees asked, can you talk more about the process for the health waiver? What to expect and tips on what to provide? Uh, look, I think it is best to see what's the latest best advice is from the migration agent, obviously, but generally, if I can speak, is that build a really good relationship with your HIV doctor. So inform them that you, um, that you are planning to apply for permanent residency, even ask them, have they previously supported um, any migrants living with HIV? Um, in the visa application process. You want to be comfortable. And if they don't know, it doesn't mean that you have to change your HIV doctor. It just means that you can ask whether they would be willing to work more closely with your migration agent, for an example. So generally, it's about that. Once you get the migration agent, and I've um, explained uh, the process a little bit to understand a uh, migration agent to choose and how to choose them. And if that can be if you can connect the two, uh, migration agent and the, and your HIV doctor, that's great. Okay, that's that's really great advice. Thank you so much. 
Mm-hmm. Um, Justin Chow uh, asks, I'd like to ask you both on your opinion on assimilation. This is a concept where people have very different feelings about. Some think it helps us have a better life in Australia. Some consider it to be a form of racism. What do you mm. think? So, I, Justin, ooh, existential, but yes. from a social <laughs> lens, I love it. Um, I look, Justin, there's a lot of concept about migration. In some ways, we can accept them. In other ways, they're also problematic. There is no... I've, I've learned about migrations more and more, and it's basically every single concept, every single way of categorizing, every single approach, it's sort of like a double-edged sword. You know, they have their benefits, but also their drawbacks. The drawbacks of the assimilation is exactly what you said. Um, and I think this is about knowing how, in a practical sense, it's about understanding how the system works. And the system now, I think it's no longer using assimilation, but I think it's using integration as a concept. There, there are a lot of differences, and but the differences can be argued. You know, no one really agreed that the differences between assimilation and integration is one or two things. Um, so it's debatable in that sense. But what integration is allowing us to think about is that it definitely signals a lot more um, neoliberal capitalist kind of view where again coming back to those kind of financial capital and all that sort of thing. Yeah, I guess for me with assimilation, it's always been quite interesting. Like I've tried to use the word acculturation instead. It's the idea that, you know, I'm being acculturated to all of these different aspects of what a Cheyenne mm-hmm. culture, Melbourne culture, Brisbane culture, and they're all becoming part of me. I think with assimilation, sometimes it implies that you lose a part of yourself because you're being part of something else. And I I disagree with that. For me, it just expands myself. Instead of losing myself, I don't really see, I don't even use assimilation for myself. I'm just, I'm really acculturating myself to the life that I'm living in now. I feel so acculturated to living in Australia. Um, And and yeah. And also acculturation, one study about LGBTIQ immigrants in Canada actually showcasing that acculturation is not a simple way of losing your um, culture back home and then gaining the culture in the host country that you live in. But sometimes often for queer immigrants, we actually develop a third culture or we become a part of a third culture. So this culture is a mixture of culture, a cultural, sexual and gender identity and gender, you know, a kind of kind of practices. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Um, another one asks, how did you find accessing services, HIV care, sexual health? community and others, did you feel that they were able to meet your needs? Being like, you know, being Medicare ineligible, like were you able to? Um, during my uh, years as a Medicare ineligible, I got a lot of support from the clinic. Um, so I didn't find that a problematic at all. But I do have to highlight, has there been instances of racism within healthcare that I've encountered as a uh, uh, people of color living with HIV? Absolutely freaking yes. Um, I have been once told that I should be lucky because I'm a migrant and I'm getting the subsidized um, uh, medications. And that was said to me after I actually get my Medicare. So uh, it's just the weirdest stuff. And, and so, uh, yes, I have encountered that. And I think the problem with the biomedicalization strategy, this focus that we're clinicians, we help people clinically. This is what we do often mask the issue of racism within healthcare and the issue of why certain engagement doesn't last or certain engagement can be very problematic in the in the uh, healthcare system. Right. Um, yeah, very, very good point, especially with just the microaggressions and, you mm. know, especially for some, I, for me, I came from a culture, in Filipino culture, we don't really believe in mental health. It's a white concept. So mm. accessing mental health support has been, had a lot of barriers and obviously my own internalized stigma around that. But also I'm really glad that we have these services because I've been able to work through so much shit and yeah. so much better for it. Especially like, you know, we have services that are free that offers counseling, that offers a lot of mental health support, mm. free psychiatry, they are available mm. for you. Please, mm. if you need to know, like know where these places are, get in touch with us, get in touch with your peer organization because they would have contacts. Um, we have another person who's asking about the bridging uh, C visa. 
Um, oh, that's a hard one because out of the five level from bridging A to E, I'm only familiar with the A and E. <laughs> I'm not quite right. sure at the level of C what you can and cannot access. Yeah, it's, I, I, I'm just going to say with all of the bridging visa, it's a very hard, hard period to be in. And I want to acknowledge that it's, it's, it's not even clear and less um, understood about the challenges that people have uh, in that period of time. Um, I wonder sometimes in some cases, the bridging class level can be changed, but I don't think that can happen for all types of visa and things like that. So I just want to acknowledge that there's so many variety. Sorry, I cannot give a much uh, more helpful answers on that one. It's okay. Um, another person said, especially with your points earlier on, like, do community, social, and cultural capital assist with the health waiver? And when do you use those as leverage? Because I applied as a refugee, it's a bit different. Refugee, it's all about that kind of refugee convention, so the Migration Act that was agreed, I think, for the Second World War. And it's basically just about establishing if people have experienced um, persecution based on those um, based on five things, um, one of them is uh, belonging to or membership to a particular social group that is ostracized and persecuted by the system and there is no legal protection. Um, uh, but health, in a way, it's not being considered because what they really focus on is more about prosecution. But what I can share with is the experiences of a lot of the um, other migrants that I've supported, that I've known through my work and also my personal life. Uh, how it is being actually utilized is actually at different level point. Because remember that your life is not all about migrations. You still have to, you know, have a job and employment and things like that. So social capital, your cultural capital, your financial capital can help you in, in securing those. Not a guarantee, again, and not all industries have the same opportunity and not all uh, ways of capital are um, similarly valued uh, by, by the system. Um, for an example, I'm um, just sharing here, is that if you if your social capital tends to sort of lock in within the, the same ethnic communities, you may still find it very difficult to, um, to kind of like broaden your opportunities to get a job in, um, uh, in Australia and things like that. And it may require you to, again, um, connect with other people um, uh, from different backgrounds and things like that. Um, but in terms of migration visa application process, usually when you get to the health waiver process, you have to provide a lot of evidence to argue that you have uh, um, uh, contributed to economic um, uh, economy in Australia. Uh, two is to identify if there is anything within your assets and your um, uh, financial background that's like, you know, can, can be sort of helpful to say, well, I got all of these, so you know, I can help to lessen some of the cost to the health system, for example. And then there is the humanitarian element, and then there is also so many ways um, uh, to, to 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 utilize this argument. I'm not gonna gonna do, go down the list because it's not a migration advice, but it's yeah. more about understanding that the health waiver process often triggers that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, with I'm just going through the questions now. Another person asked, if they ran out of options to apply for the visa, do you think it's too risky if they end up applying for a protection visa? I cannot answer that question it's just because I know that the way it is being assessed, again, protection visa is basically about the fear of future persecution. So it's future oriented. It's about assessing you in your current situations um, whether you are very likely in the future to be persecuted um, physically, psychologically, culturally, economically in your home countries. Right. So that kind of level of assessment is best done by migration agents. Right. Yeah, I guess like just to bring it some context into this person's question, they're saying that, you know, mm -hmm. in their in their home country, that if they find out that because they could be discriminated against and experience a lot of stigma because as part of the employment process, they get tested for HIV. Um, Absolutely. I think I think start a conversation with a migration agent, see um, if you, the two of you can sort of work together to provide those evidence and things like that and see whether they have some opinions about um, 
uh, whether you have a good evidence collected there or something like that. You know, again, it's all also different country by country, all different. There are so many variety variables. Um, this one's question, I think you've answered this a few times, but I mm. think it bears repeating. Uh, how do you keep yourself positive? Um, I mean, for people like us, this person said, people with HIV, it is very hard. And with so many of the processes we're going through to become permanent resident, for example, so many um, uncertainty, and it's very possible that the government will cancel your visa straight away. So how do you keep your mind? I was not naive or nor delusional that it is very likely that my uh, migration journey will end up with very bad outcomes. It's a very hard one because the way that I'm gonna answer it or the way that I think about this may not necessarily the way that any of you think, but I think it's about living life of dignity. I just want to live a life of dignity no matter what the outcome because of the system oppressions and things like that. I, I embrace that. It's, it's like racism. How do you solve racism? It's hard. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, um, and so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a different, I use different strategies at different times uh, to keep myself really positive throughout that. Yeah. But yeah. some of it I already share. But I just want to acknowledge that that might not work for everyone. But again, there is um, connecting with others who have gone through the same. It's still worth it. Yeah, thank you. And the last question for the night. Um, this person said that Hawk told them that there's a likelihood of them not succeeding because they're single male. Um, and they were more likely to succeed if they were partnered. This person is asking, are you partnered? And what did you provide to boost your application? Oh, no, 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 I'm not partnered. Uh, I applied as a refugee as a single person. Um, uh, uh um yeah that's a difficult one again um probably um if you're single then um uh you know employment labor market and things like that may or may not provide some i don't know some i've known who are single they uh, uh employer decided to sponsor them um in their industry but not all industries are um, doing these practices. I just want to acknowledge that. And even for those who do, not, not every employer has experience of sponsoring migrants. Um, so there is still all of those kind of like challenges. So it may be from there. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Hard. I'm sorry. That's okay. Look, these are very hard questions. And like you said, because migration is so complex and it changes every year as well. It's like going through the waves and you know for a lot of us if we we're, you know it's just trying to make sense for us so we feel a bit more in control or yeah, yeah. just like have a sense of peace and at least for everyone here is attended tonight at least you know that you have a community we're here you can get in touch with us whenever you want to i mean especially with me you just get in touch with me um thank you tico for sharing your story and Welcome. your journey with us and your insight and your knowledge. It's, I'm so, so grateful. Thank you so, so much. Is there anything that you would like to, any final message that you would like to pass on to our attendees or anything that you want to promote? Um, uh, yeah, uh, first of all, thank you for attending. Um, I was actually just wanting to mention, I was supposed to share a screen, um, but because we had some problems, so I have to do all of this on my phone, but I just want to say, at the moment, I am uh, recruiting participants for my study, focusing on Asian gay, bisexual, and men who have sex with men who were born in Southeast Asia or Northeast Asia, and have only been in Australia for about four years or less and living in Queensland. Um, so if you pick all of these boxes, I'm very, very keen to get in touch with you. Um, so basically, I'm just gonna share my contact um, uh, in the email uh, and what we really want to know from you what I really want to know from you is how the relationships in your migration journey throughout your migration journey has informed the way you understand about sexual health and the way that you practice sexual health great thank you um, so after this event uh, I'll be sending everyone an email 
One of them is actually a list of all of the migration agents and lawyers people have recommended um, that they've gone to and have been successful with. I'm gonna send that email through to everyone so you have a contact list and you could shop through and pick, you know, uh, which one you would like. Uh, in addition to that, there'll also be a feedback form. So please, if you have any idea of any event you want to see, any ways on how we can improve what we're doing tonight for you, please let me know. I'm here to make that happen. Um, thank you again, everyone. Before I wrap up, I'm just going to share some info um, about help, and then that's about it. Hope you all have a great night. Thank you again. Bye. So just going back on Hawk, if you anyone here needs the details, it's www.halc.org.au. They offer free um, migration and legal advice there. So please get in touch with them. Um, you can also download this guide. It's called the Positive Migration Guide. It's a guide for yeah, people living with HIV, for their families, and for people who may fail the health criteria. Again, you can download this from hawk.org.au. Thank you again, everyone, for your time, for your engagement, and for listening to our story. Hopefully, we'll see you again at our ne next event. Um, yeah, please reach out anytime. Hope you have a beautiful night. Thank you.